How many people in this room know a doctor? What about a firefighter, a, a, a brontvier, or, or a nurse? Someone who has been trained to help and save others. Someone who has spent an entire lifetime in service to their communities. How do you feel about that person? Do you feel that his or her job is noble? Do they make you feel safe? Do they make you feel comfortable? Do you see their actions as noble or pure? I do. How many people in this room know a veteran? Someone who has served in Iraq and Afghanistan. How many people here know someone who has seen combat? What do you think of that person? Does that person scare you? Does that person make you at all nervous? Do you perhaps feel sorry for what they had to do overseas? What if I told you that I was a veteran? What if I told you that I served in both Iraq and Afghanistan? Moreover, what if I told you that I was a scout sniper, that I was trained to hunt and kill men on the battlefield? If you thought about what I was capable of doing, would it scare you? Would it impact what you think of my character? Would I make you nervous? Would that influence what you thought of me? And let me ask you this, is that fair? What if I told you that I was a part of an organization? An organization that sent me alongside thousands of other military veterans into the most destroyed places on Earth, places that have just experienced cataclysmic natural disasters. And we were sent there to do nothing but to help and to serve our fellow man. Would that impact what you thought about me? Would you see that action perhaps as noble? I want to tell you a story. And that story is my story. It's also the story of millions of military veterans around the entire globe. It might just be the story of that veteran that you know. My story begins in my freshman year at the University of Wisconsin. I was a freshman, and I was sitting around a grainy television screen with some friends and some other students, and I was watching as first one tower and then a second tower fell. That day, September 11th, changed my world and the world around the, of those around me forever. It ushered in a new era, obsessed with security and with terrorism, and soon before I knew it, the most powerful nations in the world were fueling up warplanes and preparing the weapons of war. My story continues in 2005. After I graduated from the University of Wisconsin, I joined the hundreds of thousands of men and women in the United States military. I enlisted in the United States Marine Corps, and I became a private in the infantry. My country trained me for war. It taught me how to navigate at night. It taught me how to hike huge packs up hills and dig fighting positions. It instructed me in hand-to-hand -hand combat and marksmanship, and it taught me how to thrust a bayonet through the belly of my enemy. My hands, these hands, were trained for war. In 2007, my country sent me to Iraq as part of the surge. And within two weeks, we lost our first man, Lance Corporal Blake Howe, and from that point on, death and destruction visited us with a steady drumbeat. On the other hand, though, I had the privilege of seeing the greatest virtues of mankind exhibited every single day. Courage, honor, sacrifice, and love. In 2008, my country sent me to Afghanistan, the nation in which it all began. I deployed this time as a scout sniper. And over the course of seven months, I had the privilege of being embedded with both British and Afghan troops. We fought day in and day out against impossible odds with limited resources, and I, I learned something unique. These virtues that I had come to love so much in the Marine Corps, honor, courage, sacrifice, and love, were not limited to the Marine Corps. Rather, these, these troops that I was fighting alongside from Britain and Denmark, from Poland, and even Afghanistan were exhibiting these same virtues every single day. Regardless of skin color or religion, our blood all bled red. And we didn't shed it for politics. We shed it for each other. We shed it for the hope that we might be able to scratch some semblance of good out of a world full of bad. I left the Marine Corps after two combat tours in four years, looking for what was next in my life. And it wasn't long before what was next found me. In 2010, images like this were beamed across television screens all over the globe. Dust refused to settle back down to earth as terrified Haitians wailed for help. News agencies like CNN were 
were, were showing uh, footage of what was happening on the ground. And as a result, nations around the globe rallied in support, pledging billions of dollars from nations large and small. Citizens like yourself reached into their wallets and contributed what they could. And all of a sudden, organizations and militaries from around the world were mobilizing to help people in desperate need. I remember sitting in my living room watching these same images, just like you. But what was interesting for me was that these images, these images were tragic yet familiar. You see, I had been there. Somehow, I had never been to Haiti a day in my life, but I had been there. And as I looked and watched transfixed, I knew that I had to, I had to get there somehow. Luckily, 5,000 miles away, my friend and fellow former Marine, William McNulty, felt the same urge. Somehow, we could help. William and I connected, and together over the next couple of days, we put together a hasty plan. We grabbed our old packs, we dusted off our combat boots, we grabbed protein bars and water purification tabs, and we threw them in a bag. And three or four days later, against the better advice of friends and family, we made our way down to the Dominican Republic. There we rallied with a team of eight individuals, mostly strangers, and we crossed into Port-au-Prince. We called the organization really just a team at the time. We called it Team Rubicon. Because like the ancient river in ancient Rome, the border between the Dominican Republic and Haiti was our Rubicon. It was our point of no return. And once we crossed, there was absolutely no going back. Team Rubicon found itself leading mobile triage clinics throughout the, the, the battled city. We found ourselves in the hardest hit areas of Port-au-Prince, going where other organizations could not or would not go. At one point, while working at a camp deep in the heart of the city, I found myself working on a young boy. He was maybe seven or eight years old. He had tripped and fallen during the earthquake, and he had had a piece of rusted steel pierced through his thigh, in one side and out the other. Stoic, the boy refused to shed a tear, and as my latex-gloved hands worked on his leg, trying to clean his wound, I was reminded of a similar image that I had experienced back in Afghanistan two years prior. And in that experience, I had been brought a young boy, also maybe seven or eight years old, who had been shot through the same leg, in a Taliban ambush. And I sat there and I contemplated on the similarities of these two boys, separated by race, separated by religion, separated by culture and thousands of miles. They could not have been more different, yet in many ways they could not have been more similar. And while I reflected on this, my hands continued to work, and soon the boy's mother carried her off, and I hope, I pray, that he survived. You see, these hands, I looked down at them and I realized that they weren't just trained for war, they were trained to help and to heal and to serve my fellow man. Over the next two weeks, William and I found ourselves leading teams throughout this entire ravaged city. We went to Port-au-Prince uh, you know, with this intention of, of utilizing these military principles for some sort of good. And what we found was that what we had been trained to do in war was just as applicable following a cataclysmic natural disaster. At one point, William returned after going and grabbing some supplies at the airport, and he walked up to me and he said, Jake, everyone is here. All branches of the United States military, the Israelis, the British, the French, the Norwegians, the Argentinians, they're all here. Organizations from around the globe, but the only ones that are doing anything right now are the militaries. And I nodded my head and I thought about all the national flags that I had seen flying above the airport, and I thought to myself, yeah, he's right. And William continued, he said, Jake, I think we're on to something. William was right. We were on to something. You see, we went down to Port-au-Prince with the intentions of just simply helping some people that were in terrible need. But when we left, we left with the realization that with 2.5 million veterans in, this, in, in the United States, with all of these skills, we had an obligation to try to expand what it was that we were doing to more broadly engage them to help improve disasters around the globe. And so we did that. And over the course of the next year, we deployed teams to Burma and South Sudan, Chile and Pakistan. Over that year, we learned something else. We learned that not only did these opportunities present the chance for us to help improve disaster response, the chance for our two and a half million veterans in the United States to go and help and serve others, this service to others was helping and healing us. You see, what we found was that this service, this, this, this selfless service, was an opportunity to help heal the invisible wounds of war that many of us suffer from. And we knew at Team Rubicon that we had to do more. 
with two and a half million veterans coming home, we knew that we had to expand our programs and get more veterans involved. We were exploring these opportunities when the reality of their urgency hit us square in the chest. On March 31st, 2011, I received a phone call. That phone call told me that one of my best friends, Clay Hunt, had just committed suicide in Houston, Texas. Clay and I served together in Iraq and Afghanistan, where Clay had exhib exhibited these virtues of courage, honor, sacrifice, and love. Clay had been suffering from post-traumatic stress and guilt and depression, and seemingly his only solace was the service that he found in Team Rubicon. But what was really tragic was that Clay, he didn't kill himself because of what happened to us in Iraq and in Afghanistan. No, Clay killed himself because of what he lost when he came home. He lost his sense of purpose, he lost his sense of community, and he lost his sense of self. And these were three very simple things that we knew we could provide veterans like Clay with Team Rubicon. Following Clay's suicide, our efforts were to engage as many veterans in disaster response as possible, and so we shifted our focus. Unfortunately, deadly tornadoes in both uh, Missouri and Alabama provided us the opportunity all too early. When these deadly tornadoes ripped through these communities in our hometowns, towns that looked just like the ones that we had grown up in, we sprung into action and we were able to provide services like surf, search and rescue, debris clearing, command and control, and we were able to help these communities, these people that we felt like we'd grown up with, get, back, get their lives back together, get their lives back in order. We're, and, and through this service, we were able to provide these veterans with the purpose and community that they were missing. And in doing so, we have built a powerful organization that finds its strength in its people. You see, what we, have, what we have found is that by strengthening these veterans through service, we can strengthen communities. Each of these veterans has the potential to be a civilian beacon of courage, honor, sacrifice, and love, if we ask them to be. We have hundreds of examples of veterans who have answered this call, this challenge, to serve with Team Rubicon. I want to introduce you to just one. This is Chad Reynolds on the right. Chad served 13 years in the United States military in both the Army and the Navy. Over those years, Chad lost seven friends in combat, and one more to suicide. And after 13 years of service, Chad got out of the military, where he returned back to his home state of Arkansas. Chad was a husband and a father, and he had a job, but he was missing something in his life. Chad had a void that he didn't even realize. He couldn't find fulfillment. You see, he could put a roof over his family's head, and he could put food on the table, but what he couldn't do was fill that hole that he found inside of him. By the time Chad found Team Rubicon, he says he was at the lowest point in his life. Chad Reynolds might have become the next Clay Hunt, but instead he found Team Rubicon, and he answered the challenge of service. Chad's deployed with Team Rubicon on a number of missions, and he's become a tremendous leader within our organization. Chad rediscovered something about himself, that he still has more to give, and his country still needs him. A short while ago, Chad wrote me a note. And in that note, he stated unequivocally, Team Rubicon saved my life. But what we know is that Chad is not unique, not even to the United States. Last year, a year ago, almost today, Team Rubicon was contacted by a group of Afghanistan veterans from Norway. And these Norwegians had a profound impact on William and I because they, they said, you know, post-traumatic stress it's not an American soldier's problem. Nations from around the world that have answered the call to service have veterans who are coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan and facing the same challenges of reintegration that U.S. soldiers are facing. When, when Hurricane Sandy hit, there was only one course of action, bring the Norwegians in to help us with our operations. The Norwegians flew in from Oslo. They landed at JFK, uh, John F. Kennedy Airport in New York City. And they joined our teams. And over the course of four weeks, we learned that we had common experiences and difficulties, but we also had similar skills and experiences. You know, uh, the only thing that was, that was uh, th there was nothing that was different. Their soldiers were just like our soldiers, except for their soldiers were much better looking. <laughs> over the last decade, we've had millions of men and women from 43 nations all around the globe, train and fight in combat operations in Iraq, Afghanistan, 
and various other conflict zones around this country. These wars, which many have, have fairly criticized as being unjust or flat out wrong, have nonetheless created a generation of veterans that is complex, both in its challenges but also in its potential. These veterans, each with a different experience and role in these wars, has come home with varying degrees of physical, mental, and emotional pain. Conversely, many of these veterans, most of these veterans have come home with a newfound sense of inner strength, capable of incredible things if we challenge them to dare them. This talk isn't about arguing whether Iraq and Afghanistan were good wars. I'm not here to do that. This wouldn't be the audience for that. What I am here to talk about is to challenge you to think about the connected consequences of a decade of war that involved dozens of countries around this globe. Certainly there is bad that has come of these conflicts, but can we find the unintended good? Look beyond the headlines of a decade of war, and instead to that individual man or woman that wore the, the, the uniform of his or her nation. That person has changed. Sure, some bear the scars of a decade of conflict, but many others, many, have found that, that they are capable of so much more in peace. They're capable of leading. They're capable of inspiring. They're capable of changing the world around us for the better, if we ask them to. Perhaps, in decades to come, we can project diplomacy and democracy with acts of service and acts of good, and not acts of war. So what will we, as a connected world, do with these veterans? What will we do? As we face further violence in the Middle East, diminishing resources in Africa, crumbling economies in Europe and North America, what role will these veterans play? Will we treat them as the broken vestiges of their former selves that so many incorrectly see them as? Or will we challenge them to lead from the front and bring honor, courage, sacrifice, and love back into the halls of our businesses, our institutions, and our governments? Team Rubicon will continue to harness these veterans for a global good. We will expand our model of service to other coalition nations, Norway, Britain, Canada, any other nation that asks. We will create a coalition of the serving out of a coalition of the willing. And we will attempt to show the world that these veterans can do more in peace than they ever could in war. We will try to show the world that our hands, that these hands, are capable of so much more. Thank you very, very much.